Hello and welcome into this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav, world number one, Scotty Scheffler back in action and trying to do something on the PGA Tour that has not been done since 2017. That, of course, is when three consecutive events on the PGA Tour. Rex, his odds, Scotty Scheffler's odds this week at the Houston Open, again, I'm not good at gambling. I'm not going to pull a Reese Davis and say, like, this is some sort of risk-free investment. Scotty Scheffler's odds to win the Houston Open are plus 260. That is insanely low. In fact, the lowest we have seen on the PGA Tour since at least 2019. You plunking down a few shekels for Scotty Scheffler this week? Uh, I'm not because I get scared just like you do when we start talking about gambling. Then I realize that, no, it's gambling. I like gambling. It's losing that I don't like. Then it, mm. then it comes crashing down and I realize that, no, I don't like to give away my hard, hard-earned money for free. I will say, as soon as you mentioned his odds at, in Houston, I actually covered that event. must have been three years ago, four years ago, maybe now, four years. And he was trying, Scotty was trying to win his first event there. And I remember mm. going into Sunday and talking with Randy Smith on the range. Like, oh, this is like, no one can touch him. And even Randy, I remember telling me at the time, like, I, I, I golf's a funny game, man. And and so in Randy's famous words, golf is a funny game. Don't bet on it. Just, it's a funny game. Man. This was fall 2021 because he had not yet won on the PGA Tour. So he was kind years. of, he remembered that he was like that controversial kid, pick to make the, the Ryder Cup team in 2021. Yeah. And now, and now, now, and now, look at him. And now that dude has become dominant. I, I, you have to like his chances just based on what he's done in his last two starts, winning Bay Hill as, as dominantly as he did, winning the Players Championship clearly with an injury that didn't seem to to slow him up uh, coming down the stretch. And it, he's played well here, so you have to like all of those things. I, I think at this point, though, he's got his eye ahead, just like the rest of us. Three weeks. I'm not saying that takes away from him being the favorite or not, but I think everybody pretty much has their eye on the Masters. I think everyone has their eye on the masses, but I think Sky Scheffler, for whatever reason, is is uniquely qualified to handle kind of this, this three in a row and the run up to the masters. Like he mm-hmm. he very much stays present. And when interviewing him, it can almost be frustrating because you want him to talk about the masters. You want to talk about what it means to win Reno. You, know, you want to talk about kind of the historic trajectory that he has been on of late with his ball striking. And yet he has the same sort of goals and values each and every time he tees it up. He wants to commit to shots. He wants to have a good attitude. He wants to stay positive. Uh, and, and he, he just wants to stay present. That leads me to believe Rex that the masters really isn't on his mind at all. He's never taking, taking advanced trips to Augusta national. Like so many players are doing Roy McIlroy's talked uh, about how he's probably going to go to Augusta uh, Monday, Tuesday of Valero week, which I know you'll be in San Antonio uh, next week for golf channel. Scotty is never one to do that. He would rather do his work at home, knows how to play the golf course, can consult with Caddy Ted Scott on what he wants to do. And so I, I, I think he's fully focused on, on the Houston open. And then next week when he has an off week, he's not playing in San Antonio. He can start to kind of caress some of the shots that he's going to uh, know that he's going to have to face at Augusta national. Well, and that's fair. And if we're going to sit here and do the proper handicap thing, you do want to see what his health looked like on Friday. Or on Didn't Thursday. even address it. Didn't even address it. Right? Wasn't even asked about it. Yeah, that was a little on the weird side, given how much of the narrative that, that was at the Players' Championship. But since he wasn't even asked, he didn't volunteer anything about it, my guess is he's going to be fine. But anytime you have a top player, and he dismissed it pretty much from the moment it happened on Friday all the way through Sunday is the importance of it. I think Ted Scott probably gave a little bit more insight when we talked to him after the round at TPC Sawgrass. And he said on Friday, he was in pain just to hit chip shots. So you get an idea when these things happen to him. And he says, Scotty said it had happened to him before. It's just whatever he wants to define it as. He never gave us, he never gave us the technical term. Like it wasn't, Tiger Woods going down the disc talking about which ones have been fused and which ones haven't. This was very, ah, oh, it's just a pinched neck. Well, no, I don't think your trainer would call it that, but all right. Like I, I do like to your point, how he keeps things pretty simple. And in this particular case, it's probably why he's world number one, because he doesn't look ahead very often, which I just accused him to. So my guess is that's a big part of it, but on the golf course, you can just see it's part of his demeanor. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't get sideways. Even if he has a bad bounce, he doesn't get mad at a poor swing. Now we saw over the last year, him get a little aggravated with his putting, but even that didn't create a whole lot of emotion. This guy Scheffler's task Rex this week could be made easier by the fact that the second betting favorite who is either 12 to one or 14 to one Wyndham Clark is actually dealing with a bit of a back injury. 
again, these are not technical terms, but he said that he that his quote got an back went. His back went. He threw. He was he was working out in the gym on Monday at home in Scottsdale and threw out his back while doing an exercise. We'll get into your own uh, physical handicaps here shortly. But he called it a a massive muscle spasm. Was actually concerned on Monday, so just two days ago, we're recording this podcast on Wednesday afternoon that he was going to have to withdraw from this week's Houston Open. Instead, he got some rehab on Tuesday. Flew at his physical therapist on a Wednesday. I was able to hit balls and per, uh, partook in the nine hole. Pro-Am, he said he's hopeful, should be able to play, but obviously if it's going to jeopardize his standing in the Masters or any other important tournaments coming up in the next couple of months, he will not be uh, hesitating to pull out. It's a little bit of an unfortunate timing for Wyndham Clark, is it not, Rex, who has risen now to number four, the official World Golf ranking, back-to-back runner-up finishes both to Scotty Scheffler, including the, the agonizing finish at the Players' Championship with his 20-footer to force a playoff uh, horse shootout on the final green, where would you put Wyndham Clark kind of on your list of masters favorites? Because it is interesting. The reigning U S open champion will be making his masters debut is not otherwise eligible prior to this year. Uh, I I'm following the lead of our friend, Mark Schleyball ESPN. I'm doing tears for tears. Uh, no, I'm, but I'm doing tears. He's clearly in that first tier, whatever you want to call it. The A tier. No, the first block. Sky Scheffler is in his own tier. So he, uh, Wyndham I mean, Clark it, needs to be in, pure, in tier two. Yeah, I mean, I think Scotty Scheffler is, is is in his own category right now, just overall playing the game. But you're probably right, just based on his experience on that golf course. Like, if you took everything else between January and now that Scotty Scheffler has done so far this season, even if you took that away out, I would still argue at the Masters going into this year's event, he should be in his own tier. But I would put Wyndham right there behind him. I'd put Xander right there behind him. I think you touched on the thing, like, no one's done it since Fuzzy Zeller in the 70s, 72, if I'm correctly. 79. No one's, yeah. Uh, no one's won the Masters in their first try since Fuzzy Seller did it that generation ago, pretty much. There's a reason behind that. That's the type of golf course. There's a bit of a learning curve to it. And if you played well there and you know the golf course, and we see it year in and year out. I mean, I think Tiger is probably a good example. Freddie Couples, not sure if he's playing or not, but if he's playing, I think it would be a safe bet that not only does he make the cut, but he finishes, I don't know, somewhere on the upper third of the leaderboard because that's just what he does. I don't think Bernard Langer is playing because of a pickleball accident. Speaking of which, <laughs> this is this is going to be terrible <laughs> visuals. What are we what are we Those what are, are we looking at? And I, I hope one healthy I, knee I hope and there's one no very unhealthy knee. Okay, um, which why don't, you, why don't you describe since the since the visuals are, are a little bit blurry? Yeah. Apologies. Why, 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 why don't you why don't you describe what you're dealing with here? Apologies to the to the audio audience. What happened Monday night playing pickleball? And th- th- this will be quick because I know you guys hate it when we digress and ramble like this. But according to my doctor, uh Yakatina, Dr. Yakatina, who was a very nice gentleman, tear of the medial meniscus of right knee, unspecified type of tear, initial encounter, evaluate and treat is what he put on here. So I have to go through six weeks of therapy. This happened on Monday. This happened on Monday in game one of a five game afternoon. And I thought, I thought that it was uh, just a pinch and I kept limping and grabbing my knee. What was the play? Can you, can you set the scene for us? It's, it's, I don't even want to say because I wasn't even playing. It's, I don't know how you, your courts are at your place at Fancy Nakati, but like our courts are kind of stacked next to each other. So every now and again, a random ball from another court will come bounding on to ours and you just ball and you grab it and you, you throw it back mm-hmm. to him. I was just pivoting real quick to get the ball that had bounced into our court. Literally, I wasn't even doing a, a pickleball move. I was, I was just sort of making a pivot to grab a ball that had rolled onto our court and like felt the pinch. And, Ow, that hurt. <laughs> just kept going. And I kept thinking, we're at like halfway into game one. And I kept thinking for another four and a half games. No, no, no. It's just a pinch. This happens all the time. It'll be fine. So then by the fifth game, I was kind of like, man, I got to go home. Like I, I probably overdid this. Still didn't think anything was wrong. Woke up the next morning and couldn't walk. So that's where I am. Now. <laughs> I I wish you'd workshop this story a little, a little bit. Maybe maybe it was a, you know, a, a, a violent slam at the no, net. Maybe it. it was a, 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 no. a stretch trying to get the ball. No. Nope. You hurt yourself trying to be a courteous court mate. Uh, well, I, I was I wanted to get the ball out of our court quickly. Like I, we were kind of on a bit of a roll, so like I, I like to move fast when when I'm on the court. But no, I, I'm all about the honesty here. Full disclosure, full honesty. I'm not trying to hide it like Langer did. I, I hurt myself just picking up a ball. However, I played for four and a half more. And the doctor this morning tried to explain to me that oh, this is this is not um, how did he how did he put it? This was uh. He was explaining it that this this is this just didn't happen on Monday. 
that this has been going on for a, a bit of a time. That this has been building for a while. And I'm like, no, no, no. I was fine until Monday as soon as I pivoted. And like he kept trying to tell me that, no, like this builds up over time. Chronic. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. This is a I mean, chronic you're 50, injury. You're, you're, I mean, you're 56. Yeah. I, you can see some wear and tear likely on the knee. And this was kind of the. No, no. That was the part that, that he was happy with. There is no. Well, there's wear and tear on the other one because I had the. the uh, I had the uh, ACL replaced in the other one. You can actually see the hole in the other one that they drove, drove, drilled through the knee. Wait a minute, let me see what I can say. The one on the the your stage right is the one that had the ACL surgery. That one has no. Uh, he didn't see anything that concerned him there. There was no uh, arthritis or Wonderful. anything worrying. Yeah. So both of them are. He said relatively healthy knees for a 56 year old. I think the good news, even though you have to sit out for six weeks with pickleball, is that you're now heading to Augusta National, uh, as we've seen with Tiger as we've seen with Brooks Kepka, is the most difficult walk uh, of the entire year. <laughs> in addition, we'll be playing uh, Palmetto Golf Club, one of our favorite uh, courses in the world, the Sunday before the Masters. Thank you, Brooks. And that, too, is a is a very difficult walk. We call that Brown Augusta. It could be a treacherous walk for you as well. Are you at all concerned, like Wyndham Clark, what is your status Rex, for the year's first major, do you think that this could potentially be a, a hindrance to your performance? Uh, I don't think so, because all I got to do is, you know, I can limp around. I, like, no one's expecting me to perform, so I don't think it's going to be an issue. My pickleball is out for the next six weeks, and I have to go to therapy before I get on the road, because I'll be on the road for the better part of three weeks. So that was my only concern, that I needed to get this taken care of before I'm bouncing from San Antonio Hotel to the Augustus Hotel to Hilton Head Hotel. So I think I'm on, a, I'm, I'm on the path to recovery. Me and Wyndham both are feeling confident. Uh, that is good to hear. Uh, I am very curious to see how Wyndham Clark plays. I do think he is uh, kind of the unique player. Like we've seen, we've seen players make their debuts at Augusta National over the past decade. I would say, and and really star. You know, Jordan Spieth almost won on his first appearance. Sung J M uh, played particularly well. That, I think that was the November Masters in 2020. Obviously, Will Zal Torres played his way to the final group. Uh, in 2021 as well. Like it can be done. Obviously it has been a long time since a rookie or a first timer has come to the masters and won in his debut appearance. Uh, but it does seem like we're getting towards that point where maybe course knowledge isn't quite as important as it was in the past. And particularly when you look at like someone with Wyndham Clark's skill set, who absolutely bombs it, who can hit the ball exceedingly high and is so good on the greens. Uh, I think he is is the type of player who could break that who could break that streak. And I remember writing as a preview piece going into the players probably on Wednesday afternoon that no winner had ever done it in back to back years. And there was like a really good reason I asked a couple of players. And like there's some pretty legitimate reasons why that had happened before Scotty Scheffler finally did it. That's the first time it's ever happened. And it's because the golf course is a little quirky. You usually end up getting much different conditions. It doesn't really suit one style of play. All the things we could say about TPC Sawgrass. The flip side of that, going into this week, to your point, if Wyndham Clark wins, I don't think, I mean, it's going to be the narrative on Sunday afternoon, but I don't think it's going to be the driving narrative, not in my mind, for all the reasons you pointed out. Like he has all the tools and all the skills to be able to perform well on that particular golf course. The only thing he doesn't have is the experience. And I think you're right. It's probably a little bit overrated at this point. As it comes to the Houston open and this week's venue, Memorial park, uh, it was played in November last year. So it's going to be a completely different golf course than if you watch that tournament, what you're going to experience this week when you see the coverage on golf channel and NBC last fall, there was a premium on, on driving accuracy because of the uh, thick Bermuda rough. Uh, that would be just outside the fairways. It was a little bit, kind of scraggly around the edges of the green. The maintenance crew like did their best when it gets kind of dormant that time of year. Now uh, to hear players describe, it's kind of like an overseated paradise, super, super lush bombers, paradise, short, rough, uh, seemingly trying to mimic the conditions that players are going to face uh, in a couple weeks time uh, at Augusta national, but Sahi Thagala, right? So this is where I want to take this conversation. Sahi Thagala had a very interesting uh, idea that he broached during his Tuesday press conference. So in theory, being at a Muni Memorial Park, fans will be able to play on Monday, the day after the PGA Tour comes to town. And, and Sahith has has taken a little bit of an exception with some of the, uh, the TV broadcasters. And he set an example last week on the eighth hole at, at Innisbrook. It's like a 230-yard par three, super narrow green. And it's, it's like 10 yards wide. And a, a commentator said it was a quote-unquote safe shot when a player found the green like 30 feet away. And Sahith was like, nah, man, 
Like that was an absolutely striped four iron that that barely curved at all and and found the putting surface. Like that was an unbelievable shot. So his his basically his, the takeaway was that our perception is being a little bit warped and that we think PJ Tour players are are just kind of robots. So Sahis idea is basically to set up a tournament for let's call it scratch amateurs just to see what they would shoot the day after the PJ Tour comes to town. You and I have been fortunate enough to play in the Masters Media Lottery, which is played the Monday after the Masters, 25 to 30 or so media members. It's the exact same whole locations, very similar green speeds to what they faced the, the, the previous day for the final round of the Masters. The big difference, of course, is that we do not play from the tips. We play for the member tees. It's 63, 6,400 yards. It's very, very manageable. I love this idea, and I think the PJ Tour – would be wise to lean into this sort of stuff because as we mentioned repeatedly on this podcast, 72 whole stroke play events can get very monotonous, but with the explosion of YouTube golf, they're doing this, uh, they did this influencer uh, Monday qualify for the Myrtle beach event coming up. I've always thought that they should do like some sort of all-star game or skills game competition. Personally, I think the tour should lean into this sort of stuff. You buying or selling that? I'm buying it. No, I think it's a great idea. I think I got the first taste of it is, and I should look this up. It was when the U.S. Senior Open was played at Kays Valley, which is just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And, and it's such a good golf course. And I remember this was really early in my career, and it was like a Monday media day, essentially thing. And I remember how just impossibly difficult that golf course was, where I, I think if you cover enough tournaments, you get an idea of, oh, okay, this is a hard golf course relative to that golf course on the PGA Tour. But this is similar to the conversation you and I had, I think, about JT. Last week, every time I say something like, oh, JT is struggling with his putting, I always try to throw the footnote in there. And that's relative to the other 68 players in the world who made the cut, who are the 68 best players essentially in the world. So you always have to put that in context. And this particular in this particular conversation, it's really, really hard. You're right. And tell you and I want like the idea of doing it with scratch golfers is one thing. I just think you get a handful of get 12 golfers from that area to come out and do it and let the handicaps run the gamut because you're going to get someone like myself who's a 14 handicap that's going to realize really early really quickly that nope i shouldn't be out here like this is really really tough golf and i'm probably not going to enjoy this process that's what always gets me about pro-ams to be honest with you because it's you're playing on a tour caliber golf course it's not quite dialed up to that point yet like they usually wait until wednesday night to start dialing it up but you're still playing on a tour caliber golf course and you realize man these guys are so good. And you're right. I think sometimes we can underappreciate that, especially if it's Sahit Tagala and he has a four iron in his hand on a par three. That's just an impossible four iron for you and I. Well, certainly for me. I played in, I was lucky enough to play Hilton Head Media Day a few weeks ago. And Wesley Bryant was on the 17th hole at uh, Harbor Town. This, the par three going out towards Calabugi Sound. For us, it was probably playing 210 yards. And he was playing from the same spot. It was just like a sponsor thing. And I think he hit seven iron and hit it to 12 feet. And I hit four iron into the swamp. And you're like, <laughs> man. like, And he made it look really, really easy. And he'd been doing it all day long. I don't think he'd missed the green yet. And he talked about how that tee is so much easier. And he points, of course, to the tee they played during the tournament, which is another 30 yards back. And you're right. It, you don't realize how good those sharp shots are until you can hear it from someone who actually has to ex execute it. But I feel like the environment now is ripe for this sort of thing. If the PGA Tour is now leaning into this for-profit arm with PGA Tour Enterprises and sort of the, they, they want to appeal not just to the hardcore golf fan that's that's already following the PGA Tour, but kind of expand its reach, uh, this, is, this is the sort of thing that I think would be really helpful. And obviously the danger here, Rex, is that it becomes too gimmicky. And, you know, the, the, the PGA Tour calendar becomes littered with these sort of weird one-offs that I think can can take away from the Houston Opens or the Valspar Championships. But I think sprinkled throughout the year, like I would love to see like an all-star game type thing or the skills competition kind of centered around uh, the the century, which is the, the season opening event. It's in Hawaii. Like why not do close to the pin competitions, one club challenges, flop shot sort of things you know, hot streak putting, like whatever you want to do just to build up that event as sort of the kickoff event. Like to me, that makes a lot of sense. I actually really liked, I know there was some criticism of it. I actually really liked the idea of having this influencer Monday qualifier 
and it's these this player there were, were very good players on YouTube. I don't watch them personally, uh, but if you look at their swings, like they're 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 pretty damn good golfers. And to have them in a Monday qualifier and to get them to then play in a PJ Tour event, they're now going to go to their audiences and show them exactly what it's like to play in a PJ Tour event, show them exactly how difficult and how good these guys are. I love that. I think instead of having the match like we just had a couple of weeks ago in South Florida or we're going to have kind of the, during the silly season event, this is the sort of thing that I think could appeal to a, a wider audience getting scratch amateurs, one club challenges, something along the likes that that shows it, it sort of illustrates just how good these guys are as opposed to just you know they're going to shoot 15 under, 20 under and there's not really any context to it. I'd love to see the tour lean into the stuff without going so far that it becomes gimmicky. Well, and I think the USGA has probably done a better job of this than the PGA Tour has because I think over the years really the last three or four years, probably since Mike Wan took over, to be honest with you, they've done a good job of showcasing, and I would expect them to do the same thing at Pinehurst this year, showcasing the venue for that year's U.S. Open and putting players on it in that situation. Now, it's not the Monday after the U.S. Open. That's for us in the media. We can't take our tea times. But it, you do it in a... You do it the week or two beforehand leading up, and that actually gives you an opportunity to let them go out with a tour pro, whether if they're in the field or not. Because, again, what you want to do is see this relative to how difficult it is to a PGA Tour player versus how difficult it is to – and let's call it the best player at your club challenge. Like You pick out who the best player at your club is and send them out, and you decide what you think he's going to shoot at Pinehurst two weeks before the Open. Because my guess is it's going to be close to a million. Rex, the last topic for this hodgepodge preview podcast is the European Ryder Cup advisory board meeting scheduled for Thursday. Among the weighty topics that they are going to discuss is what to do about those pesky live players. Under the rules, the live rebels will lose their cards this year because they face a one tournament suspension for every live start they make. There are 14 tournaments on the live schedule. You do the math. Uh, any player who wants to play uh, for the European Ryder Cup team is required to play four DP World Tour events in 2024. Otherwise, they will lose their playing, playing privileges. Thus, they would be ineligible for 2025 at Beth Page Black. Now, Paul McGinley, our colleague at Golf Channel, a member of that advisory council, said they're really torn on what to do here. There is a certain segment of the golfing population that really wants to punish the live guys. Because they're the ones who have diluted the product. They're the ones who have divided the game. They're the ones who should be punished for what they've done. On the other hand, Europe may desperately need these guys if they want to win back the cup in Beth Page. What would you do? Would you, would you allow them to play scot-free? Would you change the rules? What would you do if you were Luke Donald? Uh, well, first and foremost, I want to touch on the idea they didn't need the live guys last year. So John Rahm would be the outlier here because he walked away. Terrell Hatton, you know, since they played the Ryder Cup uh, the last time around. So I know it's going to be a little bit different dynamic. I, I would actually kind of want to see how they have no that chance. They have no chance in 2025 if you don't have John Rahm, Terrell Hatton, Adrian Moronk and the like. No chance. 2337. Mark that. That's going to be good for uh, the social media. Uh, I disagree with you vehemently like i could not disagree with you more because we probably said the same thing going into the last Ryder cup in rome i'm, I'm sure we said the same thing that this is going to hurt the Europeans because that was lee westwood ian poulter sergio garcia who wouldn't be playing henrik stenson who wouldn't be playing we're talking john about Rahm's john going Rahm. to be a problem and i'm not john thinking Rahm. adrian moronk didn't make the team so i don't know why you would throw his name in there he, he should have made the team i would have made the argument but it didn't he turn out, they out. Him. well they didn't turn out they needed him either i would say terrell hatton is always going to be on the fence simply because i'm not even quite sure he would have qualified for, for the event. He's partners I, with Rom. Uh, I think Rom can be partners with anyone. Rom is going to be the one they miss. And so I guess in the 30,000 foot view that Luke Donald and the rest of that committee is going to have to take is, is there any way for us to find an avenue back for John Rom? And if so, then, then you start looking at the rest of them are going to want to come along as well. I would argue that at this point in time, I would much rather see these very learned individuals walk in this room and come up with a solution that does allow the live golf guys to come back. It's going to be difficult because to your point, there's a lot of personal feelings and people have very, very strong feelings when it comes to this, but absolutely not. I, 
I think the United States team is going to be favored for Beth Page, just like they normally are when it's a home game. I think the United States team is probably should win that match. But the idea that there's no chance because they don't have John Rahm, that's the only name I'm willing to grant you. I think that's ridiculous. Roy McIlroy, following John Rahm's defection. He'll be on the team. Roy will be on that team. In early December, immediately, almost his almost his gut reaction was to, oh, we've, we've got to change the European Ryder Cup rules. And at the time, they didn't have to. What will now transpire is that they are going to have to because they wouldn't be able to play the number of tournaments they need to play in order to maintain their eligibility. But that was his his gut reaction to, oh, you've, you've got to change it. We have to have John Rahm. I think that will be the prevailing sentiment for all those guys, whether it's Victor Hovland, so. whether it's Matt Fitzpatrick, whether it's Ludwig Oberg. They want to have John Rahm and the like, but I think they also recognize they need to have John Rahm and the like. He's a top five player in the world. I know he's not playing probably as well as he was a, a year ago at this time. He's still John Rahm. No, he's, he's still, still a top five player. He's still, I mean, one of the, he's still on pace to be one of the greatest European golfers ever. Of You have to change the rules in order to accommodate these guys. What's going uh, to be I, interesting is whether, whether the PGA of America – and the European tour can come to some sort of compromise and, uh, and, and have kind of universal rules as it relates to live golfers, assuming things do not get settled otherwise. And I don't know what that would be. Like, I don't want to be sitting in that room. I, I think both of us understand how difficult some of these decisions are going to be. I think there has to be a path back for the live guys. And I think there has to be a deal between the PGA tour and Lyft. Like I believe these things. And I believe that those European players who are going in that room need to, and will find a way to allow these players to come back. It's not going to be popular. There's going to be plenty of people who are angry about it, but I'm just pushing back on your concept that, Oh, they don't stand a chance. If they don't have John Rom, you're talking about essentially one out of 12 players. I'm and talking I, about John Rahm. I'm talking about Terrell Hatton. I'm talking about Adrian Moronk. Adrian Moronk has never played on a Ryder Cup team. Stop played. throwing his name out there. David He's Food. never played on a Ryder Cup. What like, does that matter? Stop. We just saw we just saw Ludwig Oberg perform quite nicely in Rome in his in his debut appearance. Did he not? Let's let's put Luke Donald on here and have him explain why, for whatever reason, Adrian Moronk was the first guy out. I don't think he should have been the first guy out. If you look at his resume going into that particular Ryder Cup, what he had done, he'd won. The Italian Open on that venue in Rome. He'd won the Irish Open. I think he'd won one other National Open. Like he really should have been if, on that if, team. I think didn't if, make I a difference. If, I think if memory serves, it was either Bobby Mack or Adrian Moronk. And Bobby Mack played reasonably well in Rome for, in the in the few appearances that he made. But it didn't make a difference. Is my point. And look, I, I John Rom will. But make it a will. Difference. But John Rom will make a difference. Adrian Moronk not being on a team that he was never on. You're trying to prove a negative here, like. It's Schrodinger's box. We don't know if it could have made a difference or not because he's locked in the box. Like, so that's a that's a that's that's a bad argument. Like, I'm not buying that. And the idea that Terrell Hatton's somehow going to swing the balance, I don't buy that one either. John Rahm's going to make a difference. And I do believe they're going to go in the room and find some way to do this. I'm not quite sure it's going to make that big of a difference if they don't, though, because I still think it's going to be a well-fought match. I still think the United States, if I had to pick, would has better than better than average chances of winning. And I don't know if that's bad for the Ryder Cup at this point. I mean, to your point, is our Terrell Hatton, Adrian Moronk, David Pooch, are those players replaceable? Yeah, probably. I mean, you could you could probably have a one for one replacement sure. with I don't know, maybe maybe Rasmus Hogard and teaming with his brother, and they could be like a completely indestructible force. I don't, I don't know when it comes to David Pooch, who has played. Uh, exceedingly well in early 2024 who knows what he's going to look like uh by fall 2025 like those are the types of players that you would at least allow the pathway so i, I wouldn't change the rule to just allow them in like i i would still I, I would still want to incentivize them to to play x number of events uh to make sure they're doing the work and to show the team that their potential future teammates that they're still committed to the cause right you can't just open the door and say Come on, on! And all of a sudden, we'll start we'll start weighing, you know, live points. Uh, it was shortly after last year's Ryder Cup, and I had a member, a previous member of the European team of the Ryder Cup team, reach out to me. Just with, you know, what are your thoughts, and what did you think of it? And don't get me wrong, this 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 previous member of the European team had no illusions that he should have been on that team, and he was well aware of the idea that look, my time has passed. His argument, though, was, and I think it applies to what we're talking about that the European Ryder Cup team is only hurting itself 
by not having a John Rahm or maybe to a certain degree a Terrell Hatton or opening up the door to future team members like Adrian Moronk. It's only hurting himself and they're hurting your most important product. So if you're looking at this from just from a commercial aspect, if that's the only thing you're kind of looking at here and you need to have the competition to be close. And the only way to do that is to make sure there's going to be some sort of crossover. You're also probably going to make everything that's happening in the universe right now, in the golf universe right now, between the PGA Tour and the Public Investment Fund, you're probably going to make those negotiations a little bit easier if the European Tour, the DP World Tour, is the one that steps up and finds a way to allow those players to cross over. They've already done it to a certain degree. You have live players playing in European Tour events on a pretty regular basis. So all you're doing essentially is doing away with the penalty which if depending on who you ask, there probably isn't going to be any kind of significant penalty for these players to come back anyway. So I, I see this as a net positive if the players in that room can figure something out. I mean, there's been five tournaments, in my opinion, that have been elevated <laughs> through, all the, through all the turmoil of the past two years. The four major championships and the Ryder Cup have only, have only risen in stature or risen in importance. It's, 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 unfathomable that the European Ryder Cup leadership would go down a path that would potentially dilute what is quite possibly the greatest spectacle in all the sports. And that's the Ryder Cup. And I also think a greater point Rex is that the bitterness and the resentment and the jealousy, and we've seen it pervasive through uh, PG tour membership and some of the infighting and what not to do uh, with creating a pathway back for live players. Like that's so counterproductive to what they should be doing. It's so short-sighted. I understand there are hurt feelings, uh, but if you take a long-term view on this, it's so obvious what has to happen. Uh, and, yet, and yet I'm still skeptical that it actually will. Well, no, if we were having this kind of, if, the, the, if we left this up to the PGA of America, and I think we have a pretty good idea of how the PGA of America wants to lean in this direction. They've been on the PGA Tour side since pretty much the beginning. Seth Waugh, the CEO of the PGA, has been pretty outspoken on this. If this was left up to the PGA of America and the players on the U.S. team, I think it would be a much high, higher bar to clear. I think it's in, going to be a much higher bar to clear to get those lib players back when and if a deal is done between the Tour and the PIP. I think because the DP World Tour has shown a degree of flexibility, not a lot of flexibility. I mean, they're start, still charging players an enormous amount of money finding players an enormous amount of money who went to live and broke broke their rules but at least they're creating some sort of avenue back i think they're going to be more open to the idea that this is something that not only can we do but we probably should do like this is our most important property as a tour is the the Ryder cup when it's on european soil because that's essentially the engine that makes everything work on the european tour that's where they get the vast majority of their funds so you need to make sure that's the best product possible. And that means making sure that those players who went to live, not only the ones like John Rahm, who are clearly an important part of the team, but also those players that you just pointed out, the ones that are the up and comers, the ones that are every two years that most Americans haven't heard of. And they end up winning four points and we're all sitting, sitting there going, well, what happened? What just happened? Like those are the players you also need to watch out for. Rex, this is your last week at home before three straight weeks on the road. We're still hoping to fire up the grill at our master's house. Last year, uh, avid listeners of the podcast will remember that we nearly had an emergency trying to cook a steak uh, in, a, in, a, nearly? in a flat iron, uh, or in, a, in a cast iron skillet, uh, nearly? Threw, it in, threw it in the oven. Things did not go well. We are hoping to fire up the Cabado Joe at our master's rental house. Absent of that, though, Rex, this is probably your last opportunity to fire it up for a while. Easter weekend. We'll be recording our podcast on Easter Sunday that evening. So what do you have on the grill the next couple of days? I found out I'm a I'm a hoarder of thing of I don't know how to put this without sounding weird. Uh, I'm I'm a hoarder. hoarder of meats. Is that is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, I guess that's the only way to say it. I was trying to avoid that. It didn't. Mm. I feel like it, it's, it's not, a little uncomfortable. Does not sound well. No, no, it doesn't sound like I'm doing something well. Don't Google that, please. Don't Google that. Uh, no. I, I feel like because I was just going through my freezer, just trying to find something over the next couple of days I could cook, and I found uh, two racks of ribs. I found a, a whole bunch of chicken and I found half a pork butt. And so between now and when I leave on Monday to go to San Antonio for three weeks, I have to figure out, I'm, I'm going to figure out. So I'm going to spend a lot of time tomorrow is my shift on, uh, on the desk. I, I'm, I'm covering all things golf related tomorrow. So I think uh, I'll be on the back porch. Yep. Make sure you're uh, refreshing those transcripts. We do appreciate sure. your service. You're not going to be doing any sort of Easter delicacies uh, for the holiday uh, weekend. 
Uh, no, because we do Easter over at my in-laws' house. So they do a big Easter egg hunt for all the grandchildren who are all grown and large people now. So it's turned into quite the affair with usually there's some sort of injury. There's usually some sort of crying. There's blood involved. Uh, hopefully no meniscus tears uh, in their right knees. Mm. Uh, yes, I'm I'm with you on that. We have, I think, three different Easter egg hunts. Like it's a it's it's apparently now Three. not just like a it's not just like an Easter brunch. Apparently there's there's Easter egg hunts on Sunday as well as Saturday and Friday as well. Uh, I'm with you. I went into the freezer. Uh, I found a boneless leg of lamb that I'll Are be you smoking. a hoarder of meats as well. Yes, oh. and we do not have a particularly big fridge or a fridge or freezer. Uh, but I went diving in there, found a boneless leg of lamb, which will be delicious. That is an Easter delicacy for sure. I also picked up. Uh, one of those uh, twice smoked hams. So I'll be throwing that on the offset, uh, getting some glaze on there, some seasoning and glaze. Uh, so we'll be eating ham and lamb uh, for the foreseeable future in the Labner house. Are you driving up to the Augustus? You are driving up to the Augustus, correct? I am driving up to the Augustus. I leave uh, in nine days uh, to begin my semi fortnight uh, at Augusta National. I'll be driving up the Friday uh, before. That is the practice round for the Augusta National Women's Amateur, where everyone plays in the Anwa, gets to play Augusta National after they do the cut to the top 30 and ties for the final round. It will be great. Okay, so you're bringing up whatever fuel we need for that grill in the backyard that didn't work last time, so we don't burn down that poor man's house like we tried to last year. Yes, I will be bringing a bag of charcoal and other goodies, uh, you know, wireless probes, uh, instant read thermometers, seasonings. Yeah, we'll we'll be well stocked in the Jeep. It should be a great trip. Uh, and I did want to bring up one more thing before we bounce out of here, because after Steve Sands was on the podcast last week and you got a little uh, little hurt by some mm-hmm. of the content, some of the comments, someone did point out something that uh, Steve Sands has a lot of behind the scenes TV stuff that he was sort of talking about that people seem to like. But and I, I wanted to do this one because I actually felt bad. I didn't even think about it. I went back and watched our roundtable from Monday. And there was a moment which it happens in TV all the time. Sometimes people notice, sometimes people don't. But where you were just supposed to pick up on the back end of me talking. Mm. I was gas bagging and I, I assume that our, our producer, Chloe had gotten your ear and just said, just pick it up on the back end and just start talking. There's a little bit of delay. So it's always weird when we're doing those round tables. I, apparently the co-host Matt Adams, who we both like didn't catch the memo. And so you two start talking at the same that time. That was a great. That was, that was a great caveat. Thank you. Yes. Yes. You two start talking at the same time and it was very awkward. And then you, you both gave each other a pregnant pause and then you started talking again, just like you see in the movies with old people on Zoom calls. I realized in that moment, having watched it again, that those moments just make me laugh on TV, even when it's me that's doing it. Like, and I, I know it's not an appropriate time to laugh because you, you should be appropriate. I mean, you, you should be professional. But when we were four wide in that screen, the look on my face is like someone just told me the funniest joke in the world. I didn't laugh out loud. Luckily, I stifled that back. But like the look on my face is I have a huge smile and I'm so happy that this just happened to you and Matt. And now I feel bad about it because I'm like, it's just it's you have to laugh at it. If not, you're, you're going to go get in the fetal position and spend the next week there. I mean, I I was given specific instructions. I'm sure you were to I'm pick it up. Friend. And so and so that's why when someone. Is, is talking and in this case it was it was matt adams who was on the desk in connecticut and again we have probably a second and a half to two second delay mm-hmm. i'm just gonna plow ahead <laughs> i'm 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 plowing ahead and i'm really not stopping for anyone if i was given specific <laughs> instructions to pick it up on the back end that leads me to believe that we have time that we have time into a commercial break we have time before we need to get to the next topic and so you know what i'm gonna take my sweet time and so that's i think that was one of my answers that went on for like two minutes because i said you know what I'm going to savor this because they were trying to cut into my time. I, I don't think they were. I, I don't think that's what's, what's happening at all. I think that somehow the traffic got crossed and that you two just stepped on each other. Those a things bit. are tough. Everyone, everyone thinks those are, those They're are not seamless easy. production, but I mean, we all have different delays. They've got to figure out on the desk. Who's asking what, yeah. you know, do you, do you pick it up? How do we work in commercials? Like there's, there's a lot that goes on that, that the folks probably don't realize. No, I, I just realized in that moment I was being a really bad teammate because I was laughing at, at what happened between you and Matt. And I probably could have been a little bit more sympathetic. Certainly, I've been through it enough times. I know how horrifying that can be on TV. But it was the, like as it's happening, I'm watching it and I start kind of giggling. And then I kind of glance the other side of the screen and I realize, oh, I was doing the same thing on live TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, when, and when it happens to you next week, I'm sure I'll be just I'm sure I'll be just, cackling as well. There's laughing. always some sort of miscommunication or mix up each each and every week. 
that's bound to happen when I, I can't turn my camera around right now, but we're essentially just looking into iPhones. There's an app on our cell phone called Live View. It's inside the middle of this like industrial size ring light. And that's how we make television from that's home. It. The magic you, of television. If you look outside the rest of my office, it is an absolute pigsty. Come on. Like my yeah, wife is on around. me. We have minutes. My wife is minutes. on me for days. There we go. To, to clean this up. And yet I can't and I don't. Here's. I mean, you look like light. you're a hoarder. You hoard meats. Uh, I just I hoard do. crap. I just, uh, I just hoard, I hoard crap in here. But, mine's mine's but no better. Is, but this mine's is, no but this better. is how I we have, make TV. I have, the, I have a dog bed. I've got all this stuff from being kicked out of my office. Like it's mine's no better. You also have, you also have an eldest son uh, who is now home, who is not appearing on the simulcast. Uh, thankfully, uh, he's at work. Yeah. Everyone's at work, so we're good. That is going to do it for this home tour edition, uh, MTV Cribs edition of the Golf Channel podcast. With Rex and Lab, we'll be back on Sunday night for a recap of the Texas Children's Houston Open. You guys know the drill. Make sure you go to mbcsports.com slash golf for the latest news and updates. Also, if you subscribe to the Golf Channel PR email, peep us at the bottom. Shout out to Jamie Palatini, who finally included the Golf Channel podcast with Rex and Lab with the company-wide email that goes out. Yes, you and I are two longtime scribes, which we'll discuss and debate the latest news and hottest topics. And not longtime friends, apparently. That's what we do here. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for the support. We'll be back in a few days. Have a great week.